Okay, so I am Mac. I am a sophomore, and uh, I mainly use uh, the mill and the lathe, which we'll go over later for, uh, for the team. And I did a, a lot of manufacturing this uh, last year, and I'm going to do a lot more this year. Um, I'm Justin. I'm also a sophomore. Um, I mainly used the, route, the CNC, our CNC router last year, but I can also use the other machines. And I'm also a manufacturing lead for our team. So, this shows our overall workflow. We usually start from our CAD where we design it. Um, for the people that don't know what CAD is, it's a software that basically you can visualize how the part is going to be in 3D and you can make a lot of precise changes. Um, after that, for all the parts that we're making, we make a drawing which shows like the critical dimensions. Um, for the lathes in the mill, which we'll talk about later, the, man the manufacturer will use those drawings to make the parts, but for the router, it's just mainly for inspection to make sure everything's in tolerance and everything's the right size. So for our router, the next step after a drawing is we do CAM, which we take our CAD and we make it into something our router can understand and use to cut. And then once we have that for one part, we use sheet output, which basically combines a bunch of those and reorganizes them into where we want it. And, it, and then it outputs one that can cut all of them in, at once. Then it goes to our router to get cut. Then once all the parts are made, we finish them. So that means like detabbing, deburring, tapping. And then after that's done, it, it all gets inspected, make sure it's all good, it's all intolerant, it's all the right measurements, it's all fit together. Then once that's done, we'll cut them, make sure they're in the right SIB system so they're ready for assembly. So uh, something we do is uh, we make a parts list for every single one of our robots. This is a way to organize all the parts we're making and like all the information about them, so like how many we need, what material they're made of, which subsystem they go to, and it's just really helpful to know uh, just like if we <coughs> sorry, uh, if we have uh, the part and uh, I guess like who made it, yeah, it, uh, there's like accountability, so who the manufacturer was and who did the drawing for the part, so we know like who to go to if something went wrong and like who can fix it. So CAM is our second step for our router. So basically we export our part file from Onshape, which is our CAD software. We import into Fusion 360, which is our CAM software. Um, and then we do all the CAM here. We use a template here, which basically has all our operations, all with the right feeds and speeds and all the, the speeds we need. And then once that's done, we emit this. And we have one G-code file for just this one part. And that this G-code file will have the same relationship to the coordinate, to the origin as a DXF when we export it. And the DXF is what our sheet output software actually sees. So that's very important. Um, also, feel free to ask questions after every slide if you have any. So we use SVN to store all our CAM related stuff. We used to use it for more, but it's mainly just CAM now. Um, so after we have that CAM done, we'll export it into the folder that has parts, the parts library, which stores all our parts for our CAM. Um, this folder also stores all the other stuff we use for CAM, including Travis Prog, which is our sheet output software, um, the output from our sheet output, and a lot of other parts. Um, so this is our sheet output software. It's called Travis Prog. It allows us to add parts that we have just cammed and we put in the SVN folder. We can add parts. We can organize them. It also shows like an outline for the sheet. We can put them all there. We can add holes to make sure that the sheet's screwed down and rigid. And then once that's done, we can emit it, and then it'll emit all the parts in the right position and this, the right amount of numbers that we want. So we made our own router. Uh, we don't really recommend others peop other people make it. Um, we had a lot of troubles, but we do have our own router. Um, so it takes the G code from the sheet output, which has all the different parts, and then we can run it. Can either we have a, a sheet area here that has an MDF board that we screw our metal sheets down in, and then we can cut it there. We also have a tube stock fixture, which this picture is showing us using, which we make for tubes. Um, 
basically a router cuts with an end mill which we use this end mill um, you guys can come up here and see it later so we use a pretty small end mill but it does cut pretty well um, basically it has an end mill there which is attached to a spindle which spins it really quickly and then this the end mill is different it's like a drill but it can cut sideways radially so then you can cut a lot of parts that go like all the way around big parts like this one um so basically it has that it's attached there there's three axes there's an up and down here there's a side to side here and there's a side to side this way so you'd cut in three axes that will cut all the shapes we really need that aren't that are basically 2d for the most part but we can cut some small 3d parts um some other key parts is that this was custom made to fit in our old lab so it's a it's a little bit of a weird size but it's covered so that none of the chips fly because in our old lab our our lab workspace was also with our shared with like our machine shop this is the same room so that's why we have a covering to protect people from the chips or something breaks in there yeah does anyone have any questions yes what do you do for cooling so we have air here and we also have mist we usually we don't use mist for wood but we use mist for both lexan and aluminum and that mist is a coolant tank right here and there's a pressurized air that connects to there and then it goes all the way around and on the same thing chip, chip management uh we just mainly use cool mist and air to blow it out yeah we just make sure the end mill's at the right height that I can actually get some out and then... There's also some seats over there. Yes? Do you have problems with your coolant swelling your MDF? Um, if we have too much coolant, it does, but it doesn't really affect the performance. We have to eventually replace it because it because we cut a little deeper because of the... It's not completely flat, so we have to replace it eventually anyways. And the MDF doesn't really have any problems with the coolant. Any other questions? So, on the left here is our tube stock fixture. It's how we cut all our tubes. It allows us a lot more flexibility in what we cut with our tubes. Um, so essentially how it works is that there's five pneumatic pistons. There's a switch on the side which is connected to our pressurized air system in the shop. And then we switch that and then it just compresses the tubes. Um, we also have another tube here. You can or a bar here that you can see that raises all the tubes so they're always at the top and then we just rotate all the sides to cut and it's all done in cam where we have every side outputted and then we can make a lot of complex parts like this one and that one any questions okay so uh, for every part we make we uh, make drawings. Uh, we make them for all the machines, but the router doesn't really need them because of what Justin explained earlier, it just goes straight to the machine. Um, but uh, it's usually used for uh, things like the mill and the lathe, where uh, it, it shows all critical dimensions on like every side of the part so that the manufacturer knows exactly how to make the part, exactly how precise the part needs to be, and just like anything special about the part they need to add on in order for it to be done. Uh, drawings are also useful for uh, something later in our process, which is inspection, and I guess I, I can go over that later, but yeah, that's drawings, uh, questions. So this is our lathe, in case you don't know, a lathe is a, a machine that spins a chuck, so this is the chuck right here very very fast and you uh you can put your materials in the chuck and that'll spin very fast and then you have these cutters so there's uh there are four cutters up here and you bring that to the material and it it cuts off metal to, so you can make a bunch of different shapes um there are four main ones we use that are up here here is a snap ring tool so uh, do you guys wait does everyone know what a snap ring is no well a snap ring basically is like a retaining groove. It has a retaining groove and we, you can snap it in and then it will prevent the part from moving. 
I don't think we have a part here that has. Well, we have a part here that has a snap ring groove. So there's like a little groove here. So this would go in a gearbox usually, and then the groove will prevent the, the shaft from sliding out and going where you don't want it to go. So this tool, it just it makes the snap ring groove. It has a very very small cutter at the end, and you just go in a certain amount, and that allows the snap ring to fit inside and not move around. This next tool is called a parting tool. It's similar to the snap ring tool, except it goes much farther in. This is if you have a very long stock and you want to cut just a bit of it off. It goes all the way in and it, it just parts the tool off from the rest of the material. We have a boring tool here. This is, uh, it cuts on the inside of the, the part you're, uh, you're using. So sometimes you'll use this. This is a, a drill chuck thing and it, it slides in. You can just drill, but if you, uh, you need something bigger, like uh, for instance this, you'll use a boring tool to kind of cut out and make the inside a little larger. Uh, the final and most commonly used tool is a facing tool that is being used right here. The facing tool just takes off material on the end and on the sides. It's, it's used for making the material shorter and uh, thinner. So, yeah. And if anyone is wondering where our machine shop, it's right there. You can see the router and blades in our mill. Was there any questions on the lathe? Okay, so this is the mill. The mill is very similar to the drill press and to the router in that it has a, it's similar to the drill press in that it has a, this kind of end mill thing that goes up and down and you can cut into parts, but then it's also similar to the router in which it cuts sideways into the material that you're using. Uh, the mill works by, uh, there's this end mill here that spins very fast and you put your part into this chuck here and the table moves around with the help of these, uh, these wheels here and, uh, and you can use that to like cut out shapes into the material like here these are three, sorry, these are the same but these are mill parts that we made. Uh, the mill allows you to like make more 3D shapes by, because uh, it's much more rigid which means like it doesn't shake as much because it's, it's huge, very very heavy as well, and it can you can make like very big parts. The reason we use the mill and not the router is because the router one it's it's much more difficult to make 3D parts on the router, uh, and also the router is not as rigid, so it's like it's not going to be as good of a part and not as accurate as a part, and that's why we have the mill to do that. And for both the mill and the lathe, we have a DRO which basically oh, yeah. is a digital readout. It shows us digitally where all the dimensions are and then we can zero. We can also, for the mill, we can use the DRO to move the, the table around if we need to do like a programmed operation. Yeah, so it's a, it's a half manual, half CNC, but it's not fully CNC. So it's like, it's most of the functions we do are manual, but every once in a while when you have to do something that's like super precise that you can't do by hand, you'll use the DRO and it'll move the table on its own. Oh yeah, that's an example of it. Uh, it would, uh, we, I made a program that basically you just put this in the clamp, then it would, uh, since it would, uh, the, you would put the end mill in and it'd go around in a circle and it'd create these pockets and we just, then it'd move it to the next location and do it. But since it's not fully CNC, you'd always have to move this, the end mill down and it would do it. The only part that the DRO can't control is the Z axis. You can control the X and Y. So. So. All of our members usually go through a tool training in order to use these tools. Uh, before doing tool training, everyone has to get a parent permission slip and they also have to pass this like super long safety test. Uh, once they do that, there's, a, there's five, like, yeah, five different types of training. Uh, there's level one tool training, there's level two tool training, then there's lathe, mill, and router training. Uh, level one, is just basic tools, it's the drill press, the bandsaw, the hand drill, and then that also lets you use all like, all like simple tools uh, that we have to our disposal in the lab. Level two tool training, this uses the sander, the notcher, the press brake, and the turret punch, which I can explain later if people want. Uh, this is an example of what level two tool training makes. So it, we'll usually have like an experienced member 
uh, teach everyone how to use the machines, and then they'd make a part on their own so we know that they know how to use the machines. Uh, for mill training and lathe training and router training, sorry, just, just lathe and mill training, we'll usually have a mentor come in and uh, teach everyone because those machines are much more complicated and much more dangerous. And then for router training, Justin will usually give like a presentation on how to use the machine and then he'll show everyone how to use the router. Yeah. Um, so we use MarkForge printers for our 3D printing primarily. Um, so that's a picture of our 3D printer. Uh, it prints Onyx, which is carbon fiber filled nylon. So it's quite strong. Um, we also share two printers that you can't really see here with the engineering teacher. Those are his other 3D printers. Um, so we primarily use 3D printing for parts that don't really need to be super strong, but are also kind of like complex shaped. So for example, this camera mount here has some complex facets that are really hard for making manufacture to be manufactured, and we don't really need it to be very strong. Um, if you really do need a part to be strong, um, our printer can have carbon fiber or fiberglass or Kevlar reinforcement. I think we used that with one part this season um, to make sure it was really strong and that it wouldn't break. Um, the 3D printer essentially works by melting down the plastic and then it just extrudes it and then it slowly builds up. So the parts really take a while to make but they can print by themselves. So usually the part, some parts can take like up to a few days and they usually are about like 12 hours long for smaller ones. Um, so we also do some carbon fiber on our robots. As you can see here, this is our catapult for this year, which we made out of carbon fiber. So the general process was we, we designed it in CAD. Um, we got a mold 3D printed by one of our sponsors. Um, we did the prep on it, we sanded it down, we sealed it so that none of the epoxy would leak in there. And then we put a coat of epoxy and then we put a layer of carbon fiber. Um, this part only has two layers. Um, this part we bought, so we put the tube here and then we laid two layers here. And then we vacuumed it down for about a day. And then we took out and we have a finished catapult. Um, some of the advantages is that this is very light, so we can accelerate pretty quickly without having any like movement problems or when we're moving. We can also, this also is a little flexible, so it shrinks around the ball if you put it in. So that holds it in place while we're moving around, so it doesn't just like fly out. So after all of our parts are made, uh, we'll have people do like the finishing touches on it. So this is deburring, notching, press break, and tapping. Deburring, uh, deburring tool is like it's a little cir a little circular blade that you use to cut off the uh, edges of a piece. This is because after a machine cuts, the, it usually leaves a burr, and if people aren't careful or if they're like trying to do stuff with the robot, you can easily cut yourself on the burr. So we'll have people deburr all these parts, all the edges and, and the holes, so that they're safe. Next we have a notcher. Usually the router, uh, there's little notches in it because we have to jigsaw parts out of the sheet. So we'll have this notcher and it just comes down and it takes off the little notch that's there. It's just also because it can get in the way and it can also be very sharp and dangerous for people. We have a press brake which basically just bends material 90 degrees. Uh, this is usually again for like router parts because the router can't bend materials on its own and so it's just yeah it's bending it for if it needs to be bent for like a, a bracket or like a battery holder or whatever we need and finally there's tapping uh, most of the mill parts need to get tapped uh, a tap make basically lets like a bolt like screw into something it, it creates threads on the inside of metal uh, so yeah there's that uh, this part is for one of our climbers, so you can see that there's a chain attached to it, so it collects the chain that goes around in our climber. So for inspection, uh, this is after all the parts are done, uh, the manufacturer will put uh, the part into this bin here, it's a to be inspected bin, and then anyone who knows how to use calipers, so calipers are like very precise measurement devices within like, how much of like one foul. 
Um, so what they'll do is they'll uh, they'll take the drawing. So that's this is the other use for the drawing. This lets everyone know who's inspecting exactly what dimensions all the parts need to be, and uh, yeah, just like that stuff. So when they're checking, they can see if everything's right, if everything's within tolerance. Uh, to sorry, I don't know if I explained this. Tolerance is basically if some measurements are more important than others, we'll say like this can only be this much bigger or this much smaller, or this can't be any bigger, but it can be a little smaller, so that the parts can be like the most functional on the robot and that they can they can work great. And we can find all these tolerances on our drawings that we make at the start for every part. Um. So. Each subsystem, which some examples are like drivetrain or climber, which basically are like a whole part on the robot, they each have a kit, which is a big tote here that has all the parts that it needs to assemble. So it could be the the motors or like small parts that we buy that go into these small bins or the finished inspected parts that we make. So we'll put all the parts here so that they're ready for assembly. Um, if you look in our lab later today, it's under where, under on the side, closer to us. Um, you'll see four bins there for different subsystems, and it's really good for us to make sure everything's organized. We know where we can find a part that we need if we need to assemble it, and we also store all our drawings in there so that people can just take it there right out to get in, to have it inspected or to make it, and it, it's really efficient for us. So here are some cool parts we've made. There's uh, this, which is, uh, I think it's pretty cool. It's lots of holes. I don't know. Uh, it's the intake. It's a lightened intake roller for our, our robot this season. Um, we want. We were really close to the weight limit, so we wanted to like um, get rid of all the weight we could. And this is one of the easiest things we could do. It actually looks pretty cool. Um, another part was in 2017. We made this part. Um, we sent it to one of our sponsors, um, J and J, and they used a lathe with live tooling, which basically means it has this was put in a lathe, but then it also has an end mill that CNC, so it can make all these complex curves. And the reason we made we like sort of overkilled it was because our previous design was too not 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 rigid enough to hold the turret which is on top, which which counterspun with it. And this is from the 2017 robot steampunk where they had like a bunch of balls they had to shoot. Um, lastly, we have a picture here for our, our robot this year. This is basically our turret mechanism at its base. So this spins and that's held in place. Um, a fun story is that this turret, when we were making um, this circular turret, Travis was using one of the lathes and uh, he was putting cool in and he was cutting and the the oil is supposed to be like cool it down but it happens to have a fire extinguish or a fire detector right above it so we pulled the fire alarm at that time so it, like triggered the fire alarm and we didn't know where the fire was but then it's kind of on a weekend so now the school was there so the fire truck came. there's like a fire alarm over there if you want to see <laughs> And we've only had this lab for like a year about now, but it was only like a few months when we had this. So we didn't really know that we had to, that there was a fire detector up there. Um, here's some of the, the cam or the, the drawings for these parts. Since this was made on the mill, it has a drawing. Since those two were made on the router, you can see the tool paths that the cam used. Any questions? How much does that thing weigh? No idea. You can feel it if you want. It's pretty heavy. I was expecting. Um, is there anything else you guys want us to talk about? Yeah. yeah, is your router able to spit out bearing holes that are close enough? Or do you yeah, they're, we can get them pretty close, and if they're slightly out of tolerance, sometimes we can just ream it really quickly, which isn't really that big of a problem. But most of the time, it's pretty accurate. Um, I think our goal for our router is about plus or minus five thou, um, but the bearing holes are usually a lot closer. Most of the most of the measurements are usually about like plus or minus two, three thou, depending on 
how it was cut and when it was like home then zeroed. Um, how long did that take? Um, that one? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't on the team then, but I expect it took pretty long. Um, any other questions? What do you mean you sent it to your sponsor? Does that mean that you sent it like away from the lab? Yeah. Um, one of our mentors worked there, so he made it there, and then we brought it. He brought it here. Did you do that big shooter wheel here, or is that sent out? This one. Um, I think we got most of it sent out, but we did the finishing touches here. I'm pretty sure. I wasn't really involved with the flywheel. I wasn't really on the team then, but that's what I think. That's what I've heard. Yeah, I was just curious because it yeah. fillets at the base or not. Yeah. Not trivial to do. <clears throat> What's the starting point for that part? For this one? Um, I assume it was just a big stock and they just used probably an end mill or a lathe to get all the way in here. And they just did all the finishing touches. Yeah. Any other questions?